Okay. I think we're used to thinking about the country of Haiti in a certain kind of way uh, here in 1996. I think we're used to thinking about Haiti, the country of Haiti, in a particular kind of way in the 1990s. Um, in the 1790s, Haiti's forebearer, the French colony that was known as Saint-Domingue, was uh, a place that occupied a very different location in terms of its visibility, in terms of its economic viability, uh, in terms of uh, the role that it played internationally, both economically as well as politically. In the 18th century, uh, at the time of the outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789, the colony of Saint-Domingue, one-third the island of Hispaniola, shares the island with the Dominican Republic, that time a Spanish colony called Santo Domingo. Um, Saint-Domingue was uh, the most productive, prosperous um, of all of the uh, plantation economies in the Caribbean. By the time of the French Revolution, probably about half of all the sugar and coffee that was produced in the entire Caribbean region, the cash crops of the 18th century, came from this one small colony about the size in square miles of the state of Maryland. So it's really a small place in certain kinds of ways. It's a place, though, that's, uh, that's, uh, whose importance belies its size in some respects. Uh, about half a million people live there in 1789. 90% of those are enslaved Africans. So that from the, from, from, the, from the point of view of the scope of the plantation economy there, it's really quite different than what we're used to, say, in, in the North American sort of context. Uh, a useful comparison w uh, would be the following. That is that there are about the same number of enslaved Africans working in Saint-Domingue in 1790 as there are in the entire uh, United States, slave states in the United States in 1790, about equal, about 400 to 450,000. But there are 30 or 40 times more whites who occupy that region in North America than would be the case in Saint-Domingue. So that, first of all, it's important to understand that this French colony, Saint-Domingue, was a very, very important place uh, internationally in terms of its pr productivity, in terms of its importance to the French international economy, but also just as, a, uh, as an emblem of uh, a kind of successful, quote-unquote, slave economy that existed at that, uh, at that time. Okay, the, the other thing is that in 1790, um, Saint-Domingue, this very small part of an island, is the, uh, with the exception of Great Britain, the largest trading partner of the United States. That is, a lot of the United States trade from all of their major ports is really running through Saint-Domingue. There's a way in which the U.S. is providing flour, horses, candles, wood, all kinds of other uh, important exports uh, in, in exchange for sugar and coffee and the kinds of co colonial exports that Saint-Domingue specializes in. And so, um, again, before this French Revolution, leading up to the French Revolution, uh, Saint-Domingue occupies an important place, particularly for, I think, that North American uh, economy. There are hundreds and hundreds of ships and hundreds and thousands of sailors who have been, who have gone back and forth over the previous uh, half century, who know Saint-Domingue, who, who have been there, who've experienced it, who understand a little bit about how it works there. Uh, and so, at the time that the revolution begins there, um, not long after the outbreak of the French Revolution. Um, obviously, that revolution focuses a certain amount of very rapt attention, informed attention, from these North Americans who have, who have already had a, a, particularly, a particularly close relationship with, with, that, uh, with that colony. Well, the, that's... that's that's a complicated question. Um, I guess there are probably two things at stake, potentially. Okay. Um, 
and and it, and I guess it depends on on one's location in North America, particularly t talking now about sort of powerful economic actors. That is, on the one hand, there may be some benefit to to a colonial revolution in a place like Saint Domingue. That is, if there's a way in which this colony can become independent of France then the United States can penetrate that market even more effectively than they have been able to. There are many people in Saint-Domingue who, who want to have a colonial revolution much like the one that has happened in North America so that they can sort of um, create for themselves their own economic network rather than having it be subject to the needs of the French metropole. So for some Americans, there may be some benefit to uh, a revolution, particularly if it leads to a kind of independence which they can take economic advantage of. Uh, on the other hand, um, the United States, of course, uh, and most of the other uh, territories that border the greater Caribbean um, are places which have made a heavy investment in slave labor and, and in the plantation regime so that the other side of this revolution, the one that it really eventually comes to dominate the way in which people look at it from outside, is the fact that it becomes very quickly, it moves very quickly from being a, a, a rebellion of some disgruntled colonial overlords to really being a social revolution against slavery, where plantations are becoming targets of the, the accumulated wrath of these workers in Saint-Domingue who, who, who have suffered um, to create the kind of prosperous economy that everybody envies so much. And if that, if that regime can be overturned, if a place like Saint-Domingue, you know, the most prosperous, the richest, the, 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 the most envied, you know, the one that appears to be most successful in the 1780s, if a place like that can be overturned, in a, uh, an African-inspired revolution from below, then clearly the, rever the reverberations of that kind of movement um, might also have the same kind of effects in other places, in Jamaica, in Cuba, you know, in South Carolina, in Virginia. So um, in some senses, that latter uh, understanding of the revolution is the one that, that really comes to, 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 to reflect um, the ways in which particularly American rulers began thinking about this rebellion, particularly, of course, in the South, where, where they have uh, the example of Saint Domingue becomes one that appears to be, appears to be problematic from the point of view of, uh, of other societies that have, that have cast their lot with this plantation regime. The revolution in Saint-Domingue reaches a major turning point in the summer of 1793. By now, uh, it's clear that, uh, to use a, maybe a uh, not very good analogy, but it was one used at the time, it's clear that the genie is not going to be put back in the bottle. In other words, the, the rebellion that's begun in Saint-Domingue, unlike other slave revolts, and, they, and there had been slave revolts all over the Caribbean you know, for 100 years, but it's clear that this one was taking on a different uh, a whole different cast than, than, than earlier rebellions had, had, had taken on. Um, the re the, many of the original rebels were still out, were still outlying. The, the economy had not been really put back together yet. Um, and in the summer of 1793, about a year and a half into uh, this, uh, this movement, um, the uh, commissioners who were in charge the French commissioners who were in charge in Saint-Domingue decide to make a very bold move. They decide to cast France's lot with the popular uprising. They decide, in, in, in effect, to issue what amounts to an Emancipation Proclamation. During the summer of 1793, um, there was a massive exodus uh, from Saint-Domingue uh, as the revolution um, managed to take over the, the uh, the most important port of that colony, Saint-Domingue, Cap Francais, which was, as it was known at the time. And literally hundreds of, well, hundreds and thousands of people um, tried to scramble aboard vessels to, to escape this rebellion. In my mind, it, 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 it's something like the, the, the 
the airlift at the end of the Vietnam War, you know, where people are scrambling to, to sort of escape and take what they can. And I think it's important to, to, to remember that that uh, confusion and that chaos that attended that, that, um, that exodus of the summer of 93 uh, meant that the exodus itself had a fairly diverse character. Obviously, um, many of those who exited were planters, their families, other whites who serviced the plantation economy, who saw in the revolution something that uh, they had to sort of be away from very quickly. But a lot of other kinds of people managed to get aboard those vessels as well. Some escaped slaves. Some of these planters brought people who, slaves whom they trusted with them. And free men and women of color as well who might have used that opportunity to try to escape some of the, some of the, uh, the impending confusion that was bound to, to, to attend that, uh, that, um, that rebellion. And so these people ended up going to various places. And many of them, because, again, the North American commercial connection was so strong, most of the vessels in, 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 in the harbor of Cap were American vessels. And so they were going back to ports in the United States. They were going back to Charleston, to Norfolk, to Savannah, um, to Philadelphia, to New York, um, and uh, it's hard to imagine the, the, the shock and surprise uh, in an era when there's not advanced news, where news only travels as fast as, as ships and people, that um, in places like Charleston and Norfolk and Philadelphia, one day people looked up and there, there in the harbor were dozens of vessels with these, um, this, this really diverse core of ragtag refugees from this revolution in San Domingue. Now, the revolution had been, had been going on for about a year and a half, but now it was clear because of this real visible and dramatic uh, immersion that these, the, the, that these Americans now had, that, that this was a very, very important event that was sort of taking place. And so in Philadelphia and in Charleston and in Norfolk, you begin to get people settling into these communities. They have a real effect on the way in which these communities are now thinking about their relationship to this French Revolution, to the Saint-Domingue Revolution. And you also begin to get, particularly in the South, but also to some degree in, in a place like Philadelphia, you begin to get the other side of the, re the response. That is, there, there's partly a response to try to help these refugees, but there's also a lot of uh, suspicion about their their underlying political motives, who they might be, what they might be about, what they might be trying to bring into this country. There's a way in which um, the, uh, the, um, these refugees attract a lot of attention, but also a lot of suspicion, as well as help at the same, uh, at the same time. And there's also considerable comment about the, the free people of color in particular who have managed to come aboard and what their what their agenda is, how should they be thought of in terms of, in terms of uh, a kind of outreach as they arrive uh, in these places. And of course, the, the closer you get to the Caribbean, the more, the more you are immersed in societies where plantation economy still operates, the higher that suspicion, obviously, uh, um, the higher that suspicion. One of the things that, that begins happening very early on in, in, in the summer and fall of 93 is, um, States begin to pass laws which attempt to limit who it is that can arrive in their ports. So that there are laws passed in South Carolina, uh, Georgia, uh, North Carolina. There are also local ordinances that are passed in various uh, uh, individual ports um, which outlaw the arrival and the presence and the moving around, the circulation, uh, particularly of, of, of people of color, free or enslaved, who, have, who are known to have been at some point in the French islands. In other words, there's a real concern that, that beneath the cloak of these refugees, there might lurk certain you know, planted um, agitators. Well, the, the, the French Revolution, um, you know, has posed in itself some, some pretty fundamental challenges to, to, uh, to the ways in which things work in many, in many countries. And, and, and I think that, that the fusing of this French revolutionary doctrine, the fact that it's revolution from below, with the, the you know, the most uh, 
intense of all, you know, dealing with the most intense of all of those um, arrangements of the Yanshan regime, the plantation economy, produces a real idea that, in fact, the way, that, you know, the, 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 the bringing together of black revolutionaries with the ideals of and the, uh, the potential radical nature of something like a French Revolution could really produce a kind of um, uh, movement that could spread from Saint-Domingue to other, to other places. Um, there was an incident in 1793, which I think um, reflects in some, to some degree what the what the what the origins of some of these apprehensions might be, um, on one of the many ships that was leaving Saint Domingue that was that was traveling to Charleston in 1793, on the way, there was a uh, there was a uh, a black Frenchman who had managed to get aboard the ship and they were traveling to Charleston and most people understood and believed that he should be on board like anybody else, although they were a little suspicious of him. But as they were en route on this sort of 12 or 13 day voyage from, from uh, Cap Francais to Charleston, he began talking about the role he had played during the revolution in Saint-Domingue, how many white people he had personally killed, how, how uh, committed he was in some sense to, to seeing whether these same kinds of things could also take place in other places that he might visit. And so the presence of someone like this, this was really sort of at the, at the heart of, you know, the, the concern about this kind of, you know, porousness of this maritime culture was kind of at the heart of, of, of these efforts in 1793, legal efforts to try to really limit the amount of contact between these North American ports, and particularly black people in these ports and black people coming from, from other parts of the, of the greater Caribbean. There was a potential, I think, um, um, you know, sla slavery's regime was one which attempted to create a situation where, of intense localism, which, it, which tried to create for slaves a very um, limited horizon in terms of of you know what constituted their world, and one of the things that this Saint Domingue Revolution was doing was really focusing attention at things that were taking place outside and opening up, in so, to some degree, a whole set of possibilities about how I might apply ideas to my situation here in Norfolk that other people had applied in other places. So that I think the the conversation, the the um, the uh, the opening up of that intellectual world had a lot to do with the ways in which North Americans, white North Americans who were in positions of power, uh, attempted to, to, to limit contact and communication between, between the Caribbean, the revolutionary Caribbean and, and North America. Well, aboard one of the vessels that left uh, Saint Domingue in 1793 on its way to Charleston, there was a suspicious black passenger aboard who, during the course of the voyage, at least according to the white passengers who were later questioned, began to talk very unreservedly about the role he had played in the Saint Domingue Revolution, about whites that he had killed, about um, his continued interest in pushing forward this agenda. Um, and. Uh, when he arrived uh, in Charleston, uh, he was arrested, and there was a there there were ordinances in Charleston by this time which were um, designed to keep individuals like this out. And so the way in which it worked in this case was the captain of the vessel was was threatened with severe punishment unless he actually took this individual back to Saint Domingue and later delivered an affidavit, uh, which which. Uh, um, Um, the captain was enjoined uh, to take this individual back to Saint Domingue, to deliver him to authorities there, and to receive an affidavit, which he would then deliver back to Charleston, which uh, validated the fact that uh, that he had made this uh, that he had made this transfer. Um, 
And this, the, you know, there may have been many other individuals who, who were more reserved about their verbal, uh, their verbal connection to this revolution, but who may have had some of the same kinds of ideas and who may, so that this, these kinds of incidents just increase the alarm of these, uh, of these uh, people in these North American ports. And in particular, it's interesting because this is something that sort of goes through the whole 30-year period in some sense. In particular, they were worried about sailors, that is, people who made regular voyages back and forth. That is, it wasn't just suspicious refugees, it was also people who, who, had, who had a business going back and forth to these Caribbean islands. Um, and so there was a lot of concern, particularly in Charleston, about what to do about sailors. Many of the merchants said, well, I have sailors who work for me, and they're very trustworthy. If you attack black sailors, that, that, that attacks my livelihood in some, in some sense. Others who said, but it's these sailors who, that we don't really know what they're bringing back and forth with them. And so there's a, there, there were ways in which this became a pretty complicated issue in terms of how to... How to manage and control communication just because movement is part of the system. Ships have to move in and out. That's the way money gets made. That's the way products get produced. That's the way trade happens. And it's those same kinds of networks that are now coming into uh, under scrutiny as possible ways in which um, undercurrents of resistance might also um, be spread as part of those commercial interchanges. Well, unfortunately, you know, it'd be great if we had, if we had the kinds of documents that would enable us to really see clearly the ways in which um, these kinds of ideas and news and information accounts of what was happening in San Domingue were circulating in black communities. Um, we don't have a lot of that, but what, but what we do have is a lot of circumstantial evidence about how this works. Um, for example, uh, there was a, uh, an individual by the name of Newport Bowers who was a, uh, a North American born in Massachusetts who had moved uh, to Baltimore. Um, and in 1793, at the same time that these dozens of ships and these flotilla of refugees arrived in North America with these accounts of the, the turn of events in San Domingue in favor of the black rebels there, Newport, a black man, decided to go in the opposite direction. So in other words, his, so, so his, his view of what was going on in San Domingue obviously conflicted a lot with the kinds of views that were being expressed by other members of Baltimore society at the time who were passing laws trying to keep limit contact with, 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 with the Caribbean. He wanted to immerse himself in that context. And so actually boarded a vessel, went to Cap Francais um, in, in the summer of 1793, and stayed there for about six months. What he was doing there, what kinds of experiences he had there, we can only imagine. But, 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 this, but this sort of countervailing movement of interest is, it seems to me, probably indicative of the way a lot of North American Africans were thinking at the time. They, they, might, have, they might have had a very different view about what was going on in San Domingue. The interesting thing about Newport Bowers' stay in Cap Francais is that we can also create another or look at another body of circumstantial evidence. That is, who were the people who were on board ships as crewmen, as cooks, as foremastmen, uh, in other capacities? who were leaving North American ports and traveling to San Domingue during the same time. There were ships from Philadelphia, from Baltimore, from Charleston. There were black crewmen, cooks, all kinds of other people who, you know, like Newport, were in San Domingue at this time, part of their job, but, they're, they, but the kinds of things that they're experiencing and then bringing back with them are things that you know, we, we can begin to see how plausible it is that there, might be a, that there might be a sort of a whole other network of communication and information that's part of the way that, that the black community is operating through, in some ways, the, uh, um, through the, 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 the nexus, the networks of these, uh, of these black maritime workers who move back and forth, back and forth, 
back and forth. And so um, opens up a very interesting sort of new way to also try to think about what's going on in these, uh, in, in, in 93. Not just the reaction of the whites who are hostile to this rebellion, but also the ways in which black people are trying to reach out and think about, understand that rebellion and learn about it in particular kinds of ways too. That's also available to them. Well, uh, in 1798, um, the British, who have tried to annex parts of Saint-Domingue, give up their effort. And again, there's, a no there's another, not as massive as the first exodus five years earlier, but there's another exodus of those people who had cast their lot with the British, and they're moving out of Saint-Domingue, leaving Saint-Domingue by this time to, uh, to again, to... Uh, Toussaint Louverture and the, and the black rebels. Um, and one of the places where uh, several uh, ships show up from southern Saint-Domingue is in Philadelphia in the summer of uh, 1798, late June, early July of 98. It's very interesting because they arrive at a particularly interesting time because Congress at that point is in fact debating what are now known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. That is, the, the corpus of legislation designed, in many cases, to, to limit uh, contact with rebellious foreigners, to, to, to enable people to be gotten rid of, to make it more difficult for foreigners coming to the United States to be naturalized, to exercise their rights as citizens, et cetera. So it's a very interesting sort of and timely uh, appearance right in the middle of this debate word reaches the congressional floor that, in fact, out in the harbor, out in the Delaware River there, there are several vessels from Saint-Domingue, some of which, they argued, or, uh, or they, they had heard, had black crews and blacks aboard, people who had been involved in uh, the British side of the Saint-Domingue Revolution, who wanted entry into Philadelphia. And so it really just... It, encapsulated in a certain kind of way all the tensions that were already being expressed there. And uh, um, it sparks a, um, a fairly lengthy debate in Philadelphia, both about who these people are, what their agenda might be, their, who, who and how many blacks are on the vessels, uh, and whether these people ought to be allowed to enter Philadelphia, all in public. Philadelphia has several newspapers that have different political agendas, and they're debating among themselves about all of these kinds of questions. Um, again, raising and, and, and really demonstrating pretty graphically the public nature about the, you know, how this Saint-Domingue revolution gets sort of exported and, and, and the fact that you know, it's really having an effect, very concrete effect in this case. In different, in different places where people are discussing it and thinking about it and having in some ways to now make some judgments about, you know, what the role in this case of Philadelphia is going to be relative to, to, uh, to people who are leaving San Domingue. They ultimately, I think, decide to admit the uh, vessels into the Philadelphia port. What happens after that, I don't know. Um, well, one of the people that was in Philadelphia at the time, along with all the other important politicians, was, uh, was uh, Vice President Thomas Jefferson. Um, and it's interesting that Jefferson, earlier in his career as Secretary of State, he had received a lot of, uh, of detailed information about things that were taking place in San Domingue, even before the revolution began, even going back into, into 1789 and 90. Um, now, as vice president and later as president in all three of these uh, offices, um, he has an awful lot of, uh, of e experience with the San Domingue Revolution. Um, and uh, at points in that, in, in that career really speaks to uh, a certain um, very pronounced um, fear about what that revolution might accomplish in, uh, in North America. Just a few months after this 1798 incident, and interestingly enough, he talks about uh, 
the danger of opening a legitimate trade with Saint-Domingue, which is an option that's being explored in 1799, 1800. That whether or not, is it, 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 would, it, would it be possible for an independent Saint-Domingue to operate just as other countries operated, sovereign, with ships with their flag flying, going back and forth, treaties, et cetera. And, and, and as this possibility begins to be discussed and talked about, particularly pursued by Toussaint Louverture and other officials in Saint-Domingue itself, Jefferson expresses uh, uh, some strong misgivings about this. And the words he uses are something like the following. I'm, I'm not quoting directly here. Uh, something like, um, we may expect, he says, if this trade takes place, black crews and supercargoes and, and other, you know, and ships from Saint-Domingue into the southern United States into, into our ports, and that may create a kind of a combustion that we sort of have to fear. And it's very interesting that he uses very, very, uh, Vividly, that image of the black crew, the black ship, uh, the black supercargo, suggesting in some sense that this experience of June of 1798, when these issues are being debated about what to do about these black people aboard these vessels, was being talked about in Philadelphia, suggesting in some ways that had a real effect on the way in which he began projecting forward about what the eventual outcome of the San Domingue Revolution might be, were the United States to recognize the independence of San Domingue and try to treat San Domingue as they would any other independent uh, nation state. Well, I guess it could be said that um, the revolution in Saint-Domingue really, really brings Jefferson to the bar to a certain degree. In other words, here's the, the creator of the Declaration of Independence, the individual who is, you know, throughout his life seen as the very emblem of uh, a kind of understanding about the importance of, of, of struggle against uh, uh, struggle in favor of uh, change and democratic structures and against sort of ossified old institutions. Every so often we have to shake, shake things up. This is Jefferson's sort of ideology. This Saint-Domingue revolution puts those ideas to the test in a way that probably no other event of his, of his life did. Because here we had, in some sense, um, the, you know, the, the, the ultimate in that setting. That is, here are the most degraded and oppressed individuals in the Atlantic world, the most exploited, taking seriously, to some degree, this promise, this, this program, this overturning of institutions that in some sense um, represent a kind of way of thinking about the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and but and so Jefferson is is put to the test in some ways here, uh, and his view of this revolution was almost always one in which he expressed fear and doubt. Um, at several points in his uh, in his career. Uh, particularly in the late 1790s as vice president. You know, he made statements of, you know, really anguishing about the ways in which this revolutionary wave that, that had taken hold in Saint-Domingue and that was moving inexorably toward undermining slavery in other places um, that wasn't necessarily something to be totally welcome. That is, there was a way in which these, this kind of a movement might, in fact, uh, um, have negative kinds of consequences. Um, and as President of the United States, as someone who was in a position to, uh, to define the, the foreign policy of the country, uh, Jefferson comes very much in opposition to this rebellion. A couple of examples uh, of, uh, of his uh, 
of his um, of his program here. Um, in the summer of 1801, after Jefferson wins the election of 1800 and takes office, um, he puts in place his own uh, Republican uh, foreign policy apparatus. Um, and one of the things that he does is, is, is to appoint a consul to Saint-Domingue to replace a Federalist consul who has been there working for the Adams administration. His name is Tobias Lear. And he sends Lear down to Saint-Domingue. Somewhat late, things were, took a little time for, 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 for everything to sort of get organized. And he arrives, Lear arrives in Saint-Domingue, interestingly enough, right around or right on July 4th, 1801, which is the 25th anniversary, the half jubilee of American independence, you know, and it's a, it's an interesting date <laughs> in, in terms of, you know, now Jefferson's president. So it's been an interesting quarter century that he's in some ways helped to, help to define by who he is. So Lear arrives in Saint-Domingue, July of 1801. And what's happened in Saint-Domingue is they're really moving toward independence. They've, they've adopted a new constitution, which has outlawed slavery in Saint-Domingue, something that the American Constitution never did, by the way, um, and created, uh, made Toussaint Louverture the governor for life of this colony. So they're still a colony, but they're acting independent. Um, Lear wants to meet Toussaint and to present his, his, uh, his papers uh, to him uh, as somebody who's going to be looking out for American trade in Saint-Domingue. So the Federalist um, consul, who's a man named Edward Stevens, a Philadelphia physician, who's been a very close friend and confidant of Toussaint, takes Lear to meet Toussaint at his office. And uh, Lear writes a very eloquent letter back to Secretary of State James Madison about his experience at that point. Very interesting. Um, Lear introduces himself. I'm the new consul. Here are my here are my papers. And Toussaint apparently looks through the papers and is is not finding something that he's looking for. Lear doesn't understand. Toussaint says, "Well, where where is my personal greeting from your new president?" I was very interested in following the election, and I'm, and I'm very congratulatory of Mr. Jefferson's having taken office. And, you know, I, I, I as, as sort of a head of state here in San Domingue, expect that, you know, Mr. Jefferson would send me personal greetings. You, you, must, you must have misplaced those. I'm, I'm embellishing a little bit here. <laughs> you must have misplaced my personal greeting. Lear's very embarrassed. Of course, he has no personal greeting. There is no letter from President Jefferson. And he so, so he sort of stammeringly says, well, this is not really a high diplomacy uh, situation here. You're not really worthy of the usual attentions that would attend, let's say, a, a uh, if, if I were, you know, in England or if I were in some other place. Obviously, there's a different kind of protocol that's part of that relationship that's not really applicable here. Toussaint takes Lear's papers, hands them back to him, and as, and as Lear says, very upset, extremely upset. Lear's kind of embarrassed, and Toussaint is very upset. And, and he looks Lear in the eye, and, and, and there, there's a way in which the passion comes through even in Lear's secondhand account of this, which is he says, you know what, if I wasn't a man of color, then I would be someone who was worthy of the usual attentions. You tell that to your president, Thomas Jefferson. When Toussaint realized that there was no personal greeting from President Jefferson, uh, he became very upset, very exercised, and he handed Lear the papers back as if he was not going to accept him as, uh, as consul. Uh, and Lear was really devastated by this incident, wrote back to Madison about it. Uh, he left without his papers being accepted by Toussaint, but reluctantly the next day 
Toussaint did accept the, uh, the appointment of Lear as consul. But there's a sense in which in that 24 hours, one can, one can imagine that Toussaint realized that he couldn't count on the United States to help him establish the kind of sovereignty that he was really looking for in his, uh, in his Republican experiment, that really Jefferson wasn't on board on this one, and that in some sense that spelled the downfall for this very hopeful revolution that he, Toussaint Louverture, had had a lot to do in terms of uh, forwarding. Well, the story of Toussaint Louverture's rise to prominence uh, it certainly has to be one of the most uh, amazing sagas of this whole 1790s period. Here's somebody who rose from, you know, very modest circumstances, uh, a person who went from, you know, be, who emerged from a, a situation where people like him uh, were in the very worst, most oppressed kind of situation, able to reverse that, able to, uh, to, to combine uh, some amazingly adroit combination of political savvy, uh, military intelligence, uh, and other kinds of, other kinds of uh, um, personal uh, strengths that he brought to his role to really push this revolution forward, to push himself forward, and to emerge in the, in the, in the space of you know, less than a decade from being a very obscure uh, individual to being a, really a player on an international stage, who, in, in the minds of many people even at the time, was the person who was probably most important as, as an emergent figure because of the kinds of because of the movement that he was connected to, because of the way in which slavery and slavery's ending had become such a important part of this international movement of these of, of, of the of the period of revolution. And Toussaint Louverture for many people symbolized in some ways the real promise of that Enlightenment period. That is somebody who had been prophesied by earlier writers that was eventually going to emerge to really try to turn the politics of this oppressive plantation society and region around and really work it, move it in a more positive, uh, in a more positive direction. And Toussaint Louverture was that individual in, in, in many ways. I guess what impresses me about Toussaint the most, um, or, or I guess what impresses me about Toussaint the most is his his struggle with an with an unbelievably difficult, unprecedented role that he had to play, with a lot of attendant difficulties. I mean, there's a there's a way in which this revolution was just ahead of its time. That is, there was no there, this wasn't the this wasn't the historic moment necessarily, for a revolution like this to emerge in the sense that there wasn't going to be support for it in any other powerful place. And so here's a, here's a revolution that's trying to be born here when most of the other territories surrounding it that are backed by big, powerful empires with navies and armies are all thinking that, that in fact, the plantation regime has to continue to exist. And this kind of a revolution that's taking place in Saint-Domingue has got to be suppressed and reversed. Toussaint, in the midst of that international hostility, tries, even so, to create for this small territory uh, a kind of sovereignty that, you know, a kind of standing in the international community. Uh, a, uh, a place that's going to have its own merchant marine and its own navy and army, and it's, going to be, and it's going to try to figure out a way to live with its neighbors through diplomacy, the same way is true in, in, in other places. Very, very uh, breathtaking vision that Toussaint Louverture sort of brings to this, to this, uh, to this movement. Um, unfortunately, a vision that... Uh, that does not get realized. <laughs>
Well, I think Toussaint thinks of the potential of an, an independent Saint-Domingue in much the same way as, you know, he sees uh, the independent United States. In other words, as a, as a, as a place where self-determination, sovereignty, responsible leadership, you know, all of the, uh, all of the, uh, you know, the requirements of a sort of Republican small r polity will be reflected here among these ex-slaves in Saint-Domingue, that, 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 that this, will be, this will become a nation state to some degree. The difficulty, of course, is that it's a black nation state. And so the, the hostility that's going to attend that obviously is something that, 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 that becomes a, very much a part of what's operating and working against the establishment of that kind of a vision. And in some ways, I think Toussaint kind of hopes that, that the Enlightenment, he has, a, he has a certain kind of optimism that the Enlightenment will out, that in some ways people will be able to look past this, um, this surface identity of race or background to really take Saint-Domingue seriously as a, as a nation among nations. Um, well, one of the things that, that uh, Toussaint is sort of a master of is real politique. In other words, it's one thing to talk about his, 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 uh, his philosophy, his hopes, but it's another thing to talk about, you know, the survival of this territory. Um, and this is a big issue, obviously, the issue about whether or not Saint-Domingue, whether or not Saint-Domingue's existence is contingent upon the eradication of slavery everywhere else. Is that the role for a place like, an emergent place like Saint-Domingue? Isn't the Saint-Domingue Revolution, which Toussaint has had a, has had a lot to do with, <laughs> Isn't that important enough that, it's, that, it, that it needs to take place in the British territories, that it needs to take place in the southern United States, that it needs to take place in the Spanish territories? There are many people uh, in Saint-Domingue and outside who believe that that's true, that in fact Saint-Domingue is not going to be able to exist unless slavery gets eradicated everywhere, and that really the role for Saint-Domingue is to be the spearhead for the, this continuing revolution that's going to eventually eradicate slavery. Uh, Toussaint Louverture is not convinced in the short run that that's exactly what Saint-Domingue ought to do. And so part of his compromise that he effects uh, with the British and with the Americans and with others is that he sort of promises that, in fact, Saint-Domingue will not be that exporter of revolution, that really what's going to happen is what we later in the 20th century know as the revolution in one country that we're going to have our revolution, but in fact, what we're going to do is take care of our own internal situation and not, in some ways, try to, try to influence the politics of other places, as long as you all, that is, the Brits and the Americans and others, don't try to influence our internal political situation. Of course, the situation itself is much more complicated than that, because, you know, what happens as soon as there's a revolt in Jamaica, which is, which is a one day sail away from Saint-Domingue, and they bring in a rebel who says, yeah, I heard about that revolution in Haiti. It, it almost doesn't matter, does it? What, who, you know, the, the, as much as Toussaint may try to placate his, his powerful neighbors, there's just going to be a way in which the very fact of this revolution and its success is going to continue to be something that's discussed and talked about and acted upon in other places. And so in a sense, it, 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 I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'd call it naivete, but there's a way in which um, the revolution in one country idea is a very going to be a very difficult one to to to, to implement. In. Um, well, the, the rise of Napoleon in France really spelled uh, disaster for um, 
the revolutionary colonies in the Caribbean where slavery had been abolished, not just San Domingue, but other, there were other Martinique, uh, or Guadeloupe, and other French places in the Caribbean. I'm, I'm totally messing this up now. Let me start over again. The rise of, uh, of Napoleon uh, to the um, office of emperor in France uh, spelled doom in some ways for these Caribbean colonies that had been undergoing these revolutions and had, in fact, abolished slavery in several places. Um, and the, the, the plan was uh, to reverse the 1794 decree to reestablish slavery throughout the French dominions and to get rid of those leaders, including Toussaint Louverture, who were a part of this whole other movement. Um, the question, of course, for the United States was how to, was how to think about this. They knew that in, that, that in some ways this French effort uh, to establish a kind of counter-revolution in the Caribbean was, was forthcoming. Um, they had a certain kind, the, the Americans had a certain kind of vested interest, perhaps, in uh, resisting the re-imposition of French power in this hemisphere. I mean, I, I mean after all, um, in some sense, uh, for Napoleon to reestablish himself as a, as a sort of colonial player in the New World um, would, in some ways, complicate American foreign policy. May be better off to have more independent nations throughout the Americas as opposed to the, the vestiges of European empire continuing to operate in the Americas. Very interesting sort of decision. Um, and it's a decision that President Jefferson has to make once um, he's approached by the French government in to, 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 to sound out what he's going to do in, in reaction to an effort to uh, establish a, a counter-revolution in Saint-Domingue, to reestablish slavery, to get rid of Toussaint Louverture. And we don't, uh, we don't have uh, necessarily President Jefferson himself talking about it, but we do have the records of the French minister who meets with Jefferson to pose this to him. And they, they meet, the minister comes out, he writes back to his, uh, to his, um, the people to whom he's responsible in France that in fact Jefferson, President Jefferson has said he'll, he won't resist this um, imposition and that in fact there's a way in which the Americans may even be available to help starve Toussaint Louverture out if, if that's uh, necessary. So, in, so, so there's, a, there's an interesting way in which um, the reimposition of a kind of imperial presence in the New World is, uh, is Jefferson elects to, to, to pursue that course as opposed to continuing to um, uh, or extending the, the support for an independent an independent Saint Domingue. Um, fortunately, for the people of Saint Domingue slash Haiti, um, the despite the the French effort and despite the Americans' uh, tacit support of that French effort, they managed nevertheless to um, establish independence uh, to resist uh, and defeat the French force under Napoleon's uh, brother-in-law. Uh, and established an independent country on January 1, 1804.